Did you know your mobile phone has more processing power than the computers that put astronauts on the moon? That's a lot of power in your hands. Computers are everywhere today and the software running on them does amazing things. It runs the phones we used to stay in touch, cars that take us places and pacemakers that keep people alive. But sometimes software restricts you by censoring messages or by preventing you from sharing media with friends. When you can't see or change how software works, you lose control of your data and your privacy. We believe that the right to use, study, share and adapt software is essential to liberty. Free Software Foundation Europe. Keeping the power of technology in your hands. All right, FSFP, turning 50 years. That's a nice one. <laughs> you want to have it again? How do I do that? I have no clue how to do that. Um, the FSFE would not be possible, and I cannot stress this enough, it would not be possible to do what we're doing, or what, what we have been doing for the last 15 years without you, our fellows and our volunteers. I think we should all give ourselves a big hand again for that. Right, we are warming up. There's going to be more opportunities to clap your hands. Um, I know that look in your face. That's the look of people who realize that I am standing between you and the party. So don't worry. We're going to make this eh, reasonably funny and reasonably entertaining, uh, as well as you can, because we're still a bunch of hackers. Um, and then we're going to proceed directly from here over to sea base where there's drinks and eventually there will also be pizza coming in. So I hope that you'll enjoy and stay around for that. Um, this video, by the way, which you just saw, could you imagine that not only do we have the video in the language which you just saw, but we also have subtitles. We have subtitles of that in 11 languages, thanks to all the wonderful translators. <laughs> That's an amazing feat, so all of you who contributed to making that possible, thank you so, so much. Um, as I said, during the evening now, we're going to award, reward, and honor a lot more of our volunteers. But before we do that, before we head off to sea base, I wanted to bring you back in time, just a tiny bit, to take you on a trip through history. Now, for those of you who don't know me, which is actually probably a few of you, um, my name is Jonas. Uh, I'm currently the executive director of the FSFE. And I was one of the co-founders all those 15 years ago. But I actually would like to start a little bit before that. I would actually like to take you well before 2001. Now, many of you know the history of the free software movement. That's reasonably well documented. But many of you, I wager, might have missed the name Jeremy Puzo. Does that name ring a bell for anyone? Okay, curious. In 1986, that's 30 years ago today, he did one of the things which eventually would become one of the core activities of the FSFE, raising public awareness of free software. In 1986, the way that he did this was that he helped contributing to launching the GNU's Bulletin the half-yearly advocacy leaflet from the GNU project. And I thought just to establish the historic context of where we find ourselves today, I would like to read a small section from the introduction of that first GNU's bulletin, because, yeah, it was 30 years ago. Um, and we're going to listen to Jeremy explain who was actually working with the GNU project at that time, who was sitting in Boston. You might find this amusing. I, I know I did. Um, first and foremost, there's our porcupine, Richard M. Stallman, the founder of Project GNU. Then there's Leonard Tower, GNU's teddy bear. Len is GNU first and so far only paid full-time employee. GNU's hawk, Bob Shassel, 
is the world's only generous treasurer. Among our volunteer hackers, there's Dean Elsner, our world-hopping platypus. I originally called him a kangaroo, but he insists he's a platypus. In case you haven't guessed, Dean comes from Australia, and Dean is writing GNU's assembler. Another Australian, Richard Mlinarik, is acting as GNU's MX guru. I'll try calling him a kangaroo and see what happens. Eric Albert, I'm going to pause here for dramatic uh, effect while you revel in the, the you know, similarity between Eric Albert 30 years ago and our own Eric Albert, who helped make this event possible. Um, Eric Albert walked in off the street on January 24th. So far, he sped up the GNU LD command to be faster than Unix's. It was much, much slower. slower. Eric claims that he is GNU's Bear with me. Humu humu nuku nuku apua, the current state fish of Hawaii. We're very happy to have the help of such a rare fish. Me, my name's Jerry Puso. I answer the mail and I send up tapes. Tapes, yes, of course. 30 years ago, this is 1986, magnetic tapes were the way in which you could land your hands or get your hands on the coveted GNU Emacs distribution. $150 quite a bit of money at that time, actually gave you an industry standard 1,600 BPI, I imagine, uh, magnetic tape containing Emax, Scheme, Hack, and Bison, sort of essential tools for a budding hacker at the time. The early days of the free software movement were obviously rather technical, as you can imagine. Jerry described GNU LD, just one of the many commands, to be much faster than the proprietary equivalent. And quite often, this was how people got hooked with free software in the first place. It was faster, better, more user-friendly, and on top of all of that, it was free. If we fast forward in time a little bit, about 13 years ahead, quite a lot has happened in the world since then. Um, we're no longer dealing with broken malloc implementations of different Unix distributions. Um, we don't need to ship our own memset function because we can't trust the one on the system. And the free software community is no longer only technical. A lot of people have come to this because the political awareness in the movement is growing. There's more people coming on, on board as writers, as translators, as artists, or graphic artists, and, and so on and so forth. And everyone is contributing to making the free software community what it is today. And of course, the ideals of the free software community is applied to other areas as well. Free culture, open data, open hardware. Creative Commons was founded in about the same year as the Free Software Foundation Europe. And just to show you exactly how closely these are related, I'll tell you one short story. So it's about Creative Commons. About four or five years ago, Creative Commons launched an interesting uh, path to renew their licenses, to release the Creative Commons 4.0 license. I was sitting with Diane Peters, who's the legal counsel of Creative Commons, and we were sitting not far from here, actually, here in Berlin, and we were discussing the latest draft of the 4.0 license of Creative Commons. And I had a sort of sticky point and we were wondering, you know, how, how do we phrase this in a, in a reasonable way? And, you know, how, how do we solve this problem? And Diane, in sort of her usual style, she, she brings up this huge binder that she has next to her and starts leafing it through and says, you know, that's not a problem. We'll, we'll just look and then copy whatever they did in the GPL. So that's where Creative Commons comes from, right? Um, but let's go back just to the years before founding the FSFE. That was in the almost midst of a sort of dot-com boom, if you can even call it that time. Um, Italian Romano Prodi was the president of the European Commission, you might remember him. Tony Blair presided over the rotating presidency of the European Union. Tony Blair was actually the first one to establish a website for the presidency. That's just before the FSFE. In free software news, of course, Fostum had barely gotten off the ground. 
companies working with free software, at least in the US, were going public head over heels. The so-called Halloween documents were released in 98, showing how Microsoft and other large corporations were really starting to treat free software as a serious threat to their models. Netscape released Netscape Communicator. And it was in this era of free software history when the idea came to start an organization like the Free Software Foundation in Europe. An organization that would be distinctly different from the FSF, both personally and financially, doing things in a slightly different way, but serving the same community. Now, a lot of people contributed to that idea, and it wouldn't do me justice to anyone to try to speak for all the various ideas that came together to found this. But for me, the discussion started around 98. Uh, it was in a discussion with RMS and then later with Tim Ney, who was the then executive director of the Free Software Foundation in the US. And we were talking about charitable donations in Europe, the problems of it, and you know what we could do to further free software. And Tim wrote an email to me in the mid of 98 or 99, saying that, quote unquote, given that regulations regarding deductions to French charities are so complicated, maybe the focus should be on Germany. Now, he didn't know it at the time, but a few years later, he got his wish. And a few of us, in May of 2001, we gathered at the Linux Hotel at Villa Vogelsang in Essen to found the Free Software Foundation Europe. And I think it is fitting now, at this time, to introduce to you to one of the people who helped us get where we are today. Ladies and gentlemen, the first president of the Free Software Foundation Europe, Georg Greve. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, 15 years, huh? Um, Yes, uh, I actually just also traveled back in time mentally a little bit to where we were back in those days. And um, I mean, Jonas and I actually, I think we ran into each other a few times because I joined the GNU project in the mid 90s. I wrote an application called the X Log Master, um, which was actually a way to get out of the whole thing that you had your terminal windows open and had tail um, running in all of them continuously, right, trying to get an idea of what's running in the system. And so I wrote an application that I could, would actually bundle that in one window and even like grab for patterns that you might be interested in and alert you. Um, the Apache developers told me back then that they were using it a lot and Richard was uh, stumbling over it, invited me to the GNU project. So that's how I initially joined the GNU project. I came through technology, through my love of technology, through always having been a technologist, into the GNU project, and um, it didn't end there. This is not where this story stopped for me, right? It wasn't about the technology anymore, and I can actually pinpoint the time where it stopped being only about the technology, it became about society. Um, and that's 1998 for me. Uh, at that time, there was a project here in Germany, um, in Paderborn, in fact, to create the clown, the cluster of working nodes. Um, it was the very first attempt to build a distributed supercomputer with Linux, as people were still calling it at those days as well. Um, it was initiated by the Linux magazine. Um, me and my roommates at the time, we drove down with our private PCs and hooked them into, into that cluster. And Given that I had registered with a GNU org email address, I was asked by Tom Schwaller, the editor-in-chief of the Linux magazine back in those days, whether I wouldn't actually want to tell participants what the GNU project is all about, because he figured people didn't really know. Well, to be honest, I didn't really know all that much about it myself back then. Um, so I started reading. I read a lot. Um, I thought a lot. I hopefully understood a bit, and then gave my very first speech about the GNU project back in the night in Paderborn, 1998. And that for me is actually, it's really interesting because I can pinpoint my enlightenment, if you so will, um, to that very night in a way. 
Um, because after that, I became aware that what we're talking about here is not just technology. It's about writing the rules of future society. There's, it's nothing less than that. Um, and we write rules that are in many ways more binding, more strongly um, influencing societies than law can be. Um, Lawrence Lessig later also codified this as code is law, but to me that was the moment when I became aware of this. Um, based on my speech, Richard, that made me GNU speaker, it's actually still transcribed, it should still be up on GNU.org, I think, that very first speech. Um, and so you can check whether that's accurate, right? So you can check me. Um, but um, I then ended up writing the Brave GNU World for the Linux magazine for, I think, about seven years, monthly column. It got spread all, all over the place. There was volunteers stepping up. Um, I mean, I remember my very first English proofreader, actually, Telsak Win, um, who's sadly no longer with us and was a dear friend. Um, we have been able to grow this from that moment on in terms of spread of the message as well as understanding of it. But remember, 1998 to 2000, 2001, right? Free software was still kind of like McCarthyist communism, right? And pe people were, I mean, this was the software patent debate. People were thinking, yeah, but this is against economy, right? Nah, you don't want that. We were deliberately um, thinking about, do we link this? software patent debate with the free software debate, because if we do, do we damage the, soft free, the software patent battle because people have misconceptions about free software as well? So, you know, do we need to fight two battles simultaneously or do we fight one and stay hidden in that and at the same time, you know, try to fight the other openly, um, which is the strategy we ultimately took. And in all of this, I mean, becoming aware of why this all mattered, uh, for me, there was this moment where I realized that free software as a principle was so important that it could not remain in only one structural vessel and it could not remain only on one pair of shoulders to carry the intellectual burden forward. Um, I mean, we're all humans, right? We're, we all die. Unfortunately, I mean, I, I'm not very motivated to do that, but I think I have no choice. Um, so I realized we needed to structurally think about this differently. And that's where my thoughts about the FSFE came from. What I wanted, what I had in mind was an association that would be shaped by many people that would actually you know, come together and distribute that load over multiple shoulders in which we work together as a community. It had to be shaped and driven by the active people who actually do things. And it could not ever depend solely on me. That was actually for me design goal zero, if you will. I wanted to make myself irrelevant as quickly as possible. It should not depend on me. Now, of course, if you've ever started to work on anything, that's kind of hard to do in the first year, right? I mean, it's, in the beginning, you know, these organizations are very fragile little things. And on top of that, the problem is that power structures, even when they are not formal, they can be informal. And some people live very well in them. Right? They have, an, have a um, social informal authority that they do not necessarily like to subject to, say, democratic process or you know, consensus finding in a larger group. Um, and that, you know, not everyone likes ultimately making themselves part of a bigger picture for the sake of having a better process and a more stable structure. So we had our, you know, a turbulent first years. It was not um, always uh, so easy, but in my back then, I guess, still youthful naivety, I thought someone had to do it. Um, and no one else was stepping up to the plate. So I figured, all right, I'll just, you know, 
not take any other job. I mean, I was a physicist at the time, still am. I was offered my PhD um, spot in a new nanotechnology institute that I could have taken. I could have worked as a software developer, which I'd done before. Or I could do this social organization that, you know, was trying to create political change. I don't know. I mean, it, it's, it probably takes a certain amount of insanity to do this. I realize in hindsight. Um, in particular, so as of course we had no money, right? So uh, I took a personal credit from the bank, started working full time. I think my monthly salary first year was something in the 200 euro realm-ish. Um, so just anything to get it off the ground, right? So we started, we struggled, but we also succeeded. We succeeded in finding people that joined that vision, that worked with us, that saw what we were trying to build, and that, you know, contributed in all the various ways in which any organization like FSFE can only ever live off contribution. Um, I mean, we can only succeed together. I mean, there's, there's no way this organization can work without every single one inside and outside this room that is part of it, in one way or another. If, if you are in any way engaging with FSFE, you're actually part of it. I'm, I'm sorry, if, you know, you are. Um, and so we actually managed to get some traction. We managed to get our first successes. And I've, I'm actually still quite proud of some of them. Um, but then at some point, you know, we actually figured out that we became structured enough that we suddenly attracted people from the outside world that were not technologists. I actually think that was a fantastic sign. I was very happy about that. Because we suddenly had people, you know, applying for internships out of the blue who did not have an actual technical job. Like they did not have a technical profile in the background. And people were skeptical, right? They were like, are these people really the right people to, you know, I mean, we're a technical community, you know, should we really offer them internships? There was a lot of skepticism around in those days and also whether we could actually offer them internships that, you know, would work for them and, you know, whether we would be doing them justice and all these kind of things. And of course, we figured as, a, as an ethical group, we'd have to pay them. And um, so it was, it was a certain struggle. And I remember meeting the very first intern of the FSFE. Um, it was very funny because... Uh, I had a girlfriend in Lausanne at the time whom I was visiting um, and then I had a trip to another conference from Geneva so it was on the train from Lausanne to Geneva um, having agreed on an interview in Geneva um, airport actually that I met uh, Matthias for the first time um, who in the beginning said oh I want to do an internship and just got to know sorry we can't do that you know um, no way. He kept at it. Right? I mean, f for me, the persistence that he showed in wanting to be part of this, I said, all right, life is not fair. The universe is not fair if you don't give people that are this persistent, this consistent, that determined a chance. So I met him and I actually we ran into each other on the train um, and we started talking there and I knew that moment that all the concerns we had in the General Assembly back in those days, right, all the concerns that people put on the table, no, we, we, we had to do this. We absolutely had to do this. It was necessary. And Matthias was just the first of very many. I mean, the FSFE internship program is actually something that, I mean, Matthias created in a way with his persistence, right, and that I am maybe unjustly, but anyhow, quite proud of. I think the FSFE internship program in part particular by not pulling only on technical people does an incredibly important job because it takes people from other fields, social sciences, law, across the board and helps them get up to speed on the values of our community and then sets them free because, and because they're all exceptionally awesome people, they end up in really interesting places, right? But they have the spirit of free software with them. So I'm actually really, really proud 
of what we achieved in those days. And I'm actually, I mean, really happy to see you as president today. Um, it's somehow, it, 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 for me, it's an interesting continuity in terms of how, you know, Carsten as well, he came actually after Matthias. I remember that Carsten, our former president, who unfortunately had to leave already, I wish he was here, um, he was approaching us after a speech, I think, in Lüneburg, right? Um, so, I mean, we started to draw in all these people. You know, the whole thing started to take shape in a life of its own. And while I actually was initially thinking I could step down in 2007, back then we were in slightly rocky waters. That was a little bit difficult. Um, so um, we figured that, uh, well, all right, you know, maybe I should stay a little bit longer. But then in 2008, I ultimately was able to declare to the assembly that I would not run next year. And, um, you know, we would have to find someone else to do this um, in future. Because for me, the fact that FSFE routinely rotate its leaders is an essential part of this organization. The fact that we, you know, share the responsibility and we have other people in leadership roles and make that a normal part of our organizational life is absolutely required. It is not healthy for the organization if the founder stays in the top role forever. Um, and so not healthy for the founder either, by the way. I mean, I mean, it's not, it, it would not have been good for me or the organization, as I think it's the case for many other other organizations where we see those patterns, it's hard to survive the founder, right? The person who first put in all the work. So I think the fact that we could do that speaks to this organization in a good way. And I spent my 2008 to 2009 largely cleaning up the messes that I had made the years before. And believe me, there were many. Um, trying to have as clean a ship as I could, right, for the next captain. Um, uh, so I did what I could to prepare that transition, handed over um, all the contacts, and, you know, seeing how Carson took office and actually continued from there. And the organization kept growing year after year. The organization kept being more successful. FSFE is bigger, better, and more successful now than in my times. For me, that is actually, in a way, the ultimate testimony of having my, d done my job, you know, as the midwife, if you will, well enough. Um, because that was the ultimate goal, to create something that is bigger than myself. We are all part of something that is bigger than ourselves. Um, and that, to me, is what defines the FSFE. Um, we have a mission. We have values, we work to spread those values, but that idea, that ideal is bigger than any of us, and we work together to achieve it. And I look very much forward to, you know, when in further 15 years we're sitting together and then Matthias will be, you know, with gray hair as well, and we will all go like, ooh, you know, remember those days. Um, and we don't know who's the president then. I'm sure it's gonna be an awesome person. Maybe one of you, who knows, I don't know. I'm looking forward to that anyhow. Thank you very much. Thanks, Georg. Um, a lot of things has happened over the years. It's impossible to even give a you know fraction of a glimpse into into everything. Um, Quite quickly, actually, in 2001 already, when we started, we, we established really what, what Georg was talking about. We wanted to actually have an influence. We wanted to influence the environment around us. We're not a technical community. We wanted to actually make an impact. Uh, we established a legal team, which uh, or the basis of it, at least, that today continues to be one of our primary activities. Uh, we did actually quite a bit of policy work already in 2001. I mean, that's you know, one of the things we realized quite early on that we wanted to do. Um, but uh, that's... You know, as Georg said, the organization struggled over the years at various points. You know, it has its ups and downs. Um, one of the ones, you know, I, I obviously remember is the pain that we were feeling around about 2005 uh, when the original office that we had um, 
which was actually donated to us and held in, in Villa Fogelsang in, in Essen where everything started. Um, that office was run on donated time um, and is really handling a lot of the the back end of our work, like shipping merchandise back and forth, and managing accounting and money in and out and, and everything. And they were really starting to struggle at the time. Um, and it is a blocker for the organization. And that's one of those discussions that took a long time internally to clarify it as well, until we finally then in 2006 took the step to actually establish our own office in Düsseldorf and hired a, a person who could actually work with, with us there. And that office actually was responsible for the merchandise and a lot of our materials that we shipped all around Europe for 10 years up until just earlier this year. So we owe a huge amount to that community and to the Düsseldorf area as well for keeping us afloat during all these years. And I think that deserves an applause as well. <laughs> now, around the same time, in around 2005, we also established the, the fellowship program. Now, how many here are fellows? Okay, fair amount of you. Now, you're lucky that you're not called something else. Um, there is a lot of crazy ideas going around at a time, all right? Um, now, I'm not going to go through all of them, but let's just say that you could have been called Freedom Ants and Bees. I'm not sure if that would have been better. Um, as Georg was mentioning, around the same time in 2004, we did recruit our first interns, or as Georg said, you know, they actually recruited us. That's a more accurate description of it. Um, we're going to get back to Matthias, but just to get the chronology straight through all our precedents, um, I'm going to mention Carson, obviously. Uh, Carson, who, yeah, he couldn't be with us here today. I hope that you saw his talk about presenting from, from Siemens yesterday. Um, but yeah, he couldn't join us this evening, evening, so I thought that instead I will just borrow just a few snippets of his own words from when he stepped down two years ago now, uh, or roughly two years ago, as I think that he described the organization and the challenges ahead of us quite well. I wrote like this. The challenges for free software have changed a lot over the past decade. We constantly need to think about how to maintain and defend our autonomy and agency in an age when governments and corporations are prying into every detail of our lives every day. In the face of these challenges, I'm proud of what we've achieved these past years. The FSFE has grown to strong advocate for users' rights and an important voice in the debate around privacy and autonomy. FSFE is a rare beast in the NGO landscape, combining a large community of local activists and supporters with professional policy work at the EU and national levels. Getting these different lines of work to support each other is something that requires constant attention, but it's also very rewarding. So, despite Carsten not being here, let's also give him a big round of applause. Now, we get to our next president, the current president. Um, I will just read out, because I think these are actually, they're very nice words. Um, I'm going to read out the, the words that Georg used when he described his first meeting with Matthias. I'm not going to go into a lot of stuff, but just to explain what Matthias was up against. So Georg wrote and said, we told him multiple times about the problems that would have to be solved. But he was indeed pretty perseverant and showed quite a bit of dedication, dedication that he continues to have for the organization to this day. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, Matthias Kirchner. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so how did I end up applying there? <laughs> um, my father once introduced me to computers and showed me a little bit of programming with basic and I thought, oh, that's cool. You can change the background color by adding some, some lines of code there. And um, 
then I lost a bit sight of, uh, of computers for some years and um, I was interested more in, in politics and um, I asked my father several times to um, subscribe to more newspapers so I have several sources of information. I don't have to rely on just one newspaper. And he said, oh, that's, uh, that's too expensive. But um, I heard there is this internet and um, there you can inform yourself from all kind of sources. So I buy a modem and a computer for you and then we do this. I, I think in the end it would have been cheaper to, <laughs> to pay for the subscriptions. But uh, yeah, that's um, how I um, was one of the first people in my school uh, with a modem. And um, some years, uh, a few years later, I got a second computer. Um, and um, they were connected with each other with one of those uh, cables through, uh, to the other room. And uh, somehow I thought, oh, it would be cool if I could send an email from my computer to the computer uh, where my brother is sitting. And um, also there were email programs on both of those computers. Um, I was not able to do that without dialing up to the internet. And then I was complaining about that in school. And a friend said, oh, I have a solution for that. And a few days later, he brought me some floppies and CDs and said, um, here, um, with this, you can achieve this. And um, well, a few days later and a lot of phone calls later with this friend, I was able, to, I saw some black uh, screen with some white uh, um, <laughs> fonts on there. And a few weeks later, I even had a graphical user interface. And it took me several months till um, and years till I was able to install an email uh, server and play around with that. But that was the beginning of that. And um, I got so interested in this. And it was so cool to, to, to meet so many people who, um, who deal about this technology and that you can learn everything there. And uh, all the people, they were so friendly. They were mailing lists. And uh, then we were setting up a local free software group. And we were going to the Linux talk, which at that time was in Stuttgart. And there are some people told me, oh, there, there was a crazy guy here walking around with a floppy on his head. I was thinking, oh, okay. Um, I didn't know Richard Stormont at that time, but um, <laughs> so I got, um, I got interested in this and I was um, starting to read uh, what's available there about uh, free software. And I read a lot of the GNU uh, philosophy pages. I thought, wow, that's, uh, that's really cool. That's, uh, it's not just about uh, technology, it's about um, social aspects, it's about political aspects, about economic aspects. And um, at that time, most people, when I wanted to talk with them about this in school, they uh, didn't want to hear that. There were also very few who wanted to talk with you about the technical things of uh, free software, but the political ones were way, way less. Um, and that was the time when I decided, okay, um, with these technical things, I can always learn, and there are lots of people who help me with that, but there is nobody who can help me with these political things. So I decided to study politics. And um, so I went to university, and I was thinking more about, like, okay, how, how is this going to be in our society? With, uh, how do we distribute power when there is uh, such a lot of power is concentrated with technology? And so that got me more and more interested. And... Um, there was this time in, the, in my studies that I had to do a seven months internship. And um, at the university, I once was walking at the campus and then I heard some people before me, uh, yeah, and there's a Debian, blah, 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 power PC. Oh, wow, uh, stop. And um, that's how I, I met a Debian developer there, or two actually. And um, at the time at the, for the internship, I asked them, um, where can I apply? Where can I do something where I can connect my political interests and my free software interests? He said, oh yeah, there is in Germany the Federal Office for IT Security and uh, there is a Free Software Foundation Europe. They also have an office here in, in Germany. I thought, okay, good. Um, for the Ministry, uh, for the Federal Office of IT Security, it was very easy. They had uh, internships and uh, you can do this, uh, say where, where you would like to do it. I did that, sent them the papers. And for FSV, it was very difficult to find anything there. And then I, I called the number which was written on this uh, website and uh, asked about an internship. And they, oh, internship, mm, uh, I'm just taking the course here. Maybe you can send an email. And uh, so I wrote an email and I got reply, yeah, we never had interns. Um, but 
till that phase, I already read so much of the, uh, I think I, at that time I read the entire FSFE website. And uh, I thought, okay, that's, uh, I really want to go there. That's really cool. And uh, yeah, so I got the first answers. Yeah, we didn't have interns. I said, yeah, maybe I can be the first one. Uh, I got an answer, uh, we cannot pay you anything. I said, yeah, I'm also not paid for being a student. Um, then there was this uh, reply that, yeah, we don't have an office. Um, uh, it's just an address, a postal address. And uh, I was proposing, yeah, maybe I, I could also work from the Boston office if, if uh, nothing else works out. Uh, but I really want to have this internship. <laughs> Um, and uh, at one point, it was, uh, yeah, I think, uh, <laughs> um, Georg sent me his travel schedule. And uh, we had a phone call, and I was very nervous because my English was very, very, very bad uh, at that time. And I thought, oh, no, no, is he German? Is he, oh, I don't know what language uh, do I have to speak Eng English when I call him? And so I, in the end, it was all fine. <laughs> and I, I got a travel schedule. We can meet here at Fostum in Brussels. We can he meet here a few hours at the Munich airport uh, or here in Lausanne at the airport. And because I was studying in Constance, I decided, okay, I go to, the, uh, to Lausanne. That's the closest. And then, yeah, we met there. And um, the postal address of FSFE, that was something before, uh, was very nice. Villa Vogelsang, very nice pictures, nice uh, villa. Um, after uh, this whole process and after Georg uh, was able to convince uh, the others, um, I ended up at uh, Sofa in Georg's one-room apartment in uh, Hamburg. <laughs> so uh, there was uh, a sofa here. Georg's table over there, and here his bed. And uh, in the morning, um, I was going on online, and then after some time, Georg wrote, okay, um, nobody else here anymore, you can come. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, so I, I started the internship at, in Hamburg, and that was the best time of, uh, of my studies ever. <laughs> um, so I met so many cool people there, and uh, it was... Uh, I, I got introduced to people who, who f uh, fought against the software patents. Uh, we, we were, uh, in, uh, again, in the court case uh, against Microsoft and supporting the European Commission. Um, and uh, all those things going on, there were people bribed out of, uh, of uh, these court cases. And uh, I, we were sitting there in Hamburg hacking, uh, writing emails, and uh, uh, traveling around Europe. And uh, that was uh, something where Georg said, OK, if you can accomplish it, that they pay for the travel, you can come with me. So I um, wrote to the to some Turkish organizer that the president uh, prefers to travel with his assistant. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so they, they said, OK. And then I asked Georg, what does that mean? He said, yeah, you're going with me. <laughs> um, <laughs> And um, yeah, so I was traveling around the Turkey in Istanbul and in, in Dublin and meeting so many people in, in Europe who, who are uh, working for free software, all people interested in the same topics I was interested. That was just uh, the, the best feeling ever. And um, then after, um, after some time, Georg asked me, um, well, we have this project here, uh, Codename Fellowship. <laughs> um, and uh, it's supposed to start next FOSTEM, uh, but we haven't uh, had so much progress there. Can you look at that and help? And that's how I, I started uh, to help with the setting up the fellowship program, how we helping to get the, the logo in Hamburg with some meetings with Stefan Richter. And so that, that was the start there. And then we, we started it at FOSTEM, which was also amazing. It was the, the coolest free software conference till, till then I, I ever um, participated in. And yeah, from, from there on, way too short, my internship was over. And uh, Georg said, well, it would be really nice to hire you or so, but you should continue to do your studies. Um, but it would be really nice if we would have someone in Berlin to do some lobby work there. And uh, I was uh, traveling with Georg and others and also I participated in some meetings. And I thought, well, yeah, that's... That sounds good. So I decided, okay, I'll switch uh, from my university and I moved from, from Constance to Berlin. And that's how, yeah, then I then volunteered uh, some years in, in Berlin doing lobby work there and uh, talking with politicians about free software. And um, finally, then in 2009, when Georg uh, left, I, um, I was employed then. And uh, yeah, and now, yeah, I somehow it's, it was always too nice to do something else. <laughs> 
And that's because of uh, all the people I met and uh, a lot of them are here in the room. And that's for me one of the things which is most important for me that uh, there are so many so awesome people in FSFE and uh, I think we will continue with that and have even more awesome people in future. But thanks a lot that you are here with us and uh, um, we, we walk this path together. Thanks a lot. We've listened to a lot of challenges that people had to get engaged in the FSFE. Um, we're a little bit better today. <laughs> Obviously, we can still improve, uh, but as, as all our organizations. Um, as we go through the evening, and I hope that you'll now join us at the sea base, um, whenever you get a bunch of old geezers like us together, uh, it's very natural that we're going to talk about history. Um, but of course, I, my sincere hope is that we're not only going to talk about history, but we're also going to look ahead and see what the next 15 years has for free software, and especially the Free Software Foundation Europe. Um, so with that, I'm going to leave you here. We're going to gather outside the front doors in about 10 minutes' time, and then we're all invited to walk together over to Seabase for drinks and eventually dinner. Thank you all.